morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be able to talk to you, share with you our concerns, because not only engineers have concerns, but uh, international civil servants have some concerns as well. And as I was preparing for this uh, uh, meeting, uh, first I took the original title that I was given, that is the 1968 Vienna Convention, do we need to rewrite it for autonomous driving? Then um, my colleague, who is the secretary of Working Party One, that deals with the Vienna Convention, said, "Eva, you shouldn't speak only about one of the Vienna Conventions. Uh, you have to speak about both." So I corrected to conventions, but I'm sorry, I forgot to correct to rewrite them. But maybe with this, uh, I draw the attention to the fact that it's not only the Vienna Convention on road traffic, but the Vienna Convention on road signs and signals that have to be looked at as well. And there are many other conventions that will be more or less impacted by some of the technological changes. But before we get into that, although maybe you remember that uh, the Inland Transport Committee serviced by the UNECE Secretariat, which is the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, is a center for the transport agreement within the UN. So while we are coming from a regional secretariat, we have the mandate to do global work. And here you can see that uh, some countries have better governance, because I would say it's a question of governance, uh, how many transport conventions of the UN have been <coughs> included in the national legislation of a country. So some countries have better governance. Uh, one of the, or some of the best uh, uh, leaders here are France or, or, or Russia and, uh, and several European countries because the dark green countries uh, show that these countries have uh, Germany as well, a very, very good leader. Uh, these countries have joined more than 40 out of the 58 legal instruments uh, we are administering. So as custodian of these legal instruments, they are all for inland transport, that is road, rail, intermodal, inter inland water transport. Um, these, these agreements, these conventions are sort of living bodies because they are constantly going through modifications, upgrading, not only because of technological changes, but because of knowledge gained uh, throughout the years. In addition to this, uh, we are um, uh, in the process of facilitating of, uh, not yet negotiations, but preparation for negotiations of one major convention, which will be in the field of railways. Um, and uh, um, of uh, not a convention, but another type of legal instrument, which will be a guidance on packing of containers, which will be a joint recommendation by the United Nations, ILO, and IMO on container packing, and that might be ready by next year. Um, as I said, modifications are constant, but uh, some of the modifications that uh, could be really interesting for you um, are for the vehicle regulations, the 1958 agreement is under consideration to be modified, and Japan and some other countries are leading the discussions on how to modify this uh, convention, this agreement, in order to um, make type approvals uh, sort of uh, mutually recognized, not only for the different parts of the vehicles, but for the whole vehicle, so a whole vehicle type approval to be introduced, which will be a big breakthrough for the automotive industry, I believe. Now, um, as um, we have a goal that we would like to see that the whole world is in dark green, we do a lot of work to convince countries that have not yet joined some of the conventions to join them. Um, well, um, joining conventions is happening in a very slow way. Uh, in the past two years, these were the accessions. Uh, those that could be, again, interesting for our discussion is that Egypt uh, joined the Vehicle Regulation Convention on 1958, and um, Turkey and Qatar joined the Vienna Convention. Turkey also joined the European Agreement supplementing the 1968 Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. Uh, we expect much more to happen, of course. Now, concerning vehicle regulations, uh, just to have a flash of uh, the world coverage where we are, and we hope that this will change even faster than the, the situation with some of the other conventions. As you can see, uh, there are some uh, 
places, uh, particularly Latin America, which are totally white, which means that they have not joined these conventions, uh, which also means that uh, neither the global regulations nor the 58 um, the regulations based on the 1958 uh, agreement are uh, committing them uh, for um, improved standards. So that could be an issue for world competition or, um, in other words, those who don't accept those safety and environmental rules that the rest of the world agreed on might have a competitive advantage because they don't implement some of the costly investments uh, in manufacturing. So maybe uh, it's a plea to you. Please, when you have subcontractors, suppliers, uh, try to use that uh, opportunity to lobby uh, with the government that they should join uh, the uh, different vehicle um, conventions, particularly the 98 or the 58 agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, concerning the periodical technical inspection agreement of 1997, uh, I should uh, complain a little bit uh, because uh, there is a lot of attention uh, that goes to new construction, new vehicles, and very little goes to maintenance of vehicles. And this 1997 agreement is about making sure that once you buy, for example, a good new vehicle, you will maintain it properly and you will take it to the periodical technical inspection properly. So the institutions in the country must be in place. So this agreement is taking off very, very slowly. Now on the uh, <coughs> Vienna Conventions, or let's put it like that, the uh, Conventions on the Rules of the Road, uh, that is the Convention on, on uh, Road Traffic and the Convention on Road Signs and Road Signals. This is the combined map of the Conventions on Road Traffic of 1949 and 1968. As yesterday, uh, during dinner with Bryant, we had a discussion about predecessors, and I quickly uh, thought through uh, some of the uh, preceding conventions. So uh, here they are. Um, in 1990, there was a convention on motor traffic. Then, in 1926, uh, that convention was considered to be not good enough, obsolete, uh, not comprehensive enough, so an international convention relating to road traffic was agreed on, and uh, so an international convention relating to motor traffic was agreed on. Later on, they noticed that, well, these agreements, these conventions don't deal much with road signs and signals, and that would be important too. So in 1931, uh, the unification of road signs agreement uh, was agreed on. Parallel with that, a little bit later, in 1943, um, the Convention on the Regulation of the Inter-American Automotive Traffic uh, was agreed on. Uh, however, in 1949, uh, when the UN was already up and running, um, there was a need to consolidate the knowledge of all these previous agreements. So the 1949 agreements, the Convention on Road Traffic and the Convention on Road Signs and Signals, were negotiated as um, replacing the previous different conventions, consolidating and replacing. Um, in the 60s, with the technological um, changes, governments started to complain that, well, the 1949 conventions are good, 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 but uh, there are already so many modifications, and some of the modifications didn't go through in, based on the legal structure of the 49 conventions. So actually, because some of the modifications were slowed down, they didn't go through, there was a decision by governments in ECOSOC that we need a new convention which would be more comprehensive than the 1949 convention. So the 1968 conventions, which are the Vienna conventions, one on road traffic uh, and the other one on road signs and signals, they were negotiated, they were negotiated in Vienna, but before they were negotiated, the working party one, that is the road safety working party, uh, serviced by the UNEC Secretariat and in the framework of the Inland Transport Committee, drafted the two conventions. As a result of that, when governments came together for the diplomatic conference in Vienna, they managed to come to an agreement in a month and they were authorized to sign the agreement after the negotiations. So before they left Vienna, those who wanted to sign, they signed. 
there were much more governments participating in the negotiations than those who signed. Um, don't ask me why, it would be an interesting uh, interview question uh, to them. Uh, New Zealand, Australia were extremely active in the, in the diplomatic conference, they didn't sign. Um, but what happened and why we still keep the 49th convention? Uh, because although the 68 conventions were to replace the 49 conventions, interestingly, many countries who were contracting parties to the 49 convention did not sign the 68 convention. And even today, what we experience that some countries uh, place their notification of accession with our treaty section in New York for the 49 convention. Uh, two years ago, we had a series of discussions with some African countries, and we explained that once you join, they did not um, uh, join any of the four at that time. Once you join, focus on the Vienna conventions because they incorporate the 59 conventions as well, uh, 49 conventions. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, on the road traffic, one of the countries joined the Vienna Convention, that is from 68, and on road signs and signals, they joined the 49 Convention. So because of this and uh, of this special situation, we decided that maybe for countries, uh, developing countries or countries in transition, the 49 Conventions are more um, accessible, more uh, easy to, to, to use, so we are handling both conventions now parallel. Um, so, sorry. Uh, no, no. Something has happened. No. Um, for the road signs and signals convention, we don't have so many contracting parties, but interestingly some are coming from Latin America. So the goal here as well, uh, to increase the uh, participation of countries, of all the countries in the world. Um, now I would like to shift, because it was a little bit like the introduction. And um, watching for the time, I will not go through all of this. However, I would like to under, uh, underline that we have to put these legal instruments into the context of innovation, innovation in transport and their impact on the society. And, uh, when, you, when you speak about, um, uh, for example, uh, railways, you wouldn't think of the societal impact. Uh, but actually, the railways offer the territorial integration for countries, and it happened at the time when nation states started to emerge, when societal integration took place. Um, when we speak about cars, often we think of, of nice, flashy cars, very nice. But actually, the societal impact of the car was to introduce democracy. Before that, you had people who could afford to take a coach um, and people who could afford to walk perhaps to other places. Uh, but they were not a many people were not able even to move from the village where they were born. Uh, with the motor vehicle, with the car, Actually, this democracy was introduced that people started to be able to be mobile, uh, mobile in the world. Aviation is not there because I wanted to highlight only the Ilan transport innovations. And if we jump a little bit, now what is the innovation of today? What is the new mobility? Uh, I believe there is already a conversion between um, transport uh, and uh, uh, information and communication technologies. Um, and this conversion between the two sectors is um, emerging not only because of the automated vehicles, but, but in many other areas as well. So I personally believe that it's the intelligent transport systems in the broad sense of the word that is the new innovation that will bring societal change. Um, and, and so I believe that this will help solving a tension, offering some solutions. What tension do we have? The big tension is that there is limits to growth of mobility. We just cannot grow transport as fast as we did that in the past. But at the same time, there is an extremely growing demand for more mobility. So on one hand, we cannot grow it. We cannot grow it because we have sustainability concerns like dependence on oil, um, environmental pollution, safety. Um, scarcity of space, etc., etc. So there are all these constraints because of which we are not able to grow as fast as we grew in the past. 
but uh, we have a huge growth of demand. And this huge growth of demand is first of all because there is, thanks God, poverty reduction in the world. And that poverty reduction means that there will be more people in the middle class. And those who are in the middle class, they want to move more, more often, and, and to take longer distances. And they will want to have more independence in their movement as well. Uh, so cars which offer this independence will be important for them unless there are other better solutions like public transport. According to some forecasts, surface transport is going to double because of this um, in, in the next 30 years or so. So that's a huge, huge increase. So how to handle that without getting suffocated for that I believe, and um, uh, we had discussions with the government, so they seem to agree on that, that ITS can offer doors for solutions. Um, why ITS is so beautiful, it is still not widespreadly used. So we had a strategy um, uh, review why ITS is so underutilized in the world. And this, this chart shows uh, only one of the considerations in our strategy paper that you can download from our website. Um, and it identifies a number of obstacles for ITS. Um, here I would like to highlight two. One is the, up, uh, the lukewarm political will and the limited public understanding what ITS can bring to the table. And the other issue is the different speed of the public and the private sector, particularly if you think of, you know, the business on the automotive industry side and the public sector, that is road and highway management on the public side. Well, very different qualities of, of considerations. And all of this could be boiled down to the issue that ITS is still considered to be an innovative technology. True. But actually, it's much more than that. It's an economic development tool. And that role of ITS is not fully recognized. However, if we say that ITS um, finds it difficult to be widespread, then what about automated uh, uh, driving or, or driverless uh, cars? Uh, well, even in this aspect, um, maybe we should, we should consider that um, um, maybe driverless cars will face much more problems than ITS. Nonetheless, there is already some historic experience. And uh, we don't even notice those things uh, in our everyday life. But in aviation, in, in maritime transport when you are harboring, in, um, in uh, people movers at airports, or with regard to metro trains, uh, or the Docklands uh, train in, in London. So there is already automation in the different modes of transport, and the public actually accepted or did not care too much. So there are hopes that it will work as well. Um, now, do I believe in uh, driverless cars or not? Uh, I think it's coming, but I don't know whether we will like it. Um, so that, that remains to be seen. And, I don't think we fully know the benefits. So we hear, hear a lot about different benefits with this type of, of new technology that is automated uh, driving. Um, among them, congestion management, efficiency, and efficiency will con uh, contribute to reduce environment impact, et cetera, et cetera. But are they there, really there? And there are some problems, liability, the Vienna Conventions. Are we blowing it out of proportions or not? That's a question. Um, <coughs> NHTSA identified automation on five levels. Now, I ask, I ask you, do we need the fifth level solution in legal terms when in technology we are saying that the five levels and the full automation, the full self-driving is not yet coming so soon? Well, I don't know. And please remember the intermodal aspects as well. The other day when I asked some people how to save lives at road rail level crossings, the answer was, well, we don't deal with that, the bars are there. Well, uh, recently I've learned that in Australia, they developed the system. They had the uh, research supported by the Australian government. Um, uh, this uh, research is uh, based on the use of dedicated short range communication. They say it works, and now they are considering marketing it. So let's not think of road transport only, but think of multimodal. Uh, the policy angle, very quickly. I think that 
Um, the regulatory issue may be solved earlier, but the policy will have a problem. And uh, how can you regulate when you don't know what you want to regulate? Eh? Uh, you remember, Seneca said, if you don't know where you want to go, you will never find a good wind. So um, the lawyers, the regulators, are to find a good wind, but you have to tell them from the policymaker side which way to go. We have already a recommendation by some countries, um, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Russian Federation, and Sweden, for the modification of the Vienna Conventions and for the modification of the Supplementary U Europe Agreement and for the modification of the 1949 Agreement. So it's there. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, recommendation will be discussed in New Delhi at the WP1 meeting in December. Nonetheless, from policy uh, perspective, do we need to put together automated cars with not, uh, or autonomous cars with non-autonomous cars? Do we need dedicated infrastructure, de dedicated lanes? I liked yesterday this approach to have this step-by-step -step approach, uh, uh, maybe for for parking, for um, construction uh, lanes, or maybe for tunnels, which could be an issue where you have already a toll. But then how pricing will be handled and how much the safety can be captured. So whose liability is it? That will remain a, a question, even if we modify the Vienna Conventions. As long as insurance doesn't like it, uh, well, it will, it will be a problem. And for the liability, there are another set of questions. Product liability. The vehicle manufacturer will, will have to take some product liability. Then the liability of the infrastructure constructor, the liability of the road manager, whether the road is properly maintained, or the traffic manager. Do you need a different type of traffic management for the future? Who is going to finance that? And the driver liability. Now, if blind drivers uh, um, can uh, um, be accepted as drivers, they will not be able to intervene. So we cannot expect that they will take over. So driver in control. The potential compromise I've already mentioned to you might be in December, but um, um, you can see already a development. Three years ago, um, the um, mantra was that as long as automation supports the driver, it's not an issue with the Vienna Conventions. Now the mantra is, the Bible is, that uh, we focus onboard vehicle technology and maybe we will have this step-by-step uh, -step approach uh, with a different level of automation. Um, uh, so in the modification for the Europe Agreement, which is supplementing the Vienna Convention, there is a responsibility that the driver should be able to turn off the automated system. I will not explain this, just I highlight to you that once we are serious about, for example, automation and automated driving, we need to capture the benefits. Now, we have a tool already available, and I talked to many of the FISITA members in 2010 in the Budapest Congress about the start of the For Future Inland Transport Systems project, which is a CO2 calculator. This project has been completed to the extent that the model has been developed. We have some pilot runs, and again, you will have the slides, you can look at them. This is based on vehicle stock. So if there are proven benefits for CO2 reduction, for uh, local environment pollution reduction, for safety, then it will be able to capture it. Uh, for the time being, we don't have that. And, and it looks at other things as well. Uh, and as, as the last message, uh, moving on, I would like to draw the attention that uh, it's important to have innovations within one area, but it's good to look out of the window and what's happening in the neighborhood. So what kind of mobility we are going to have in the future? We don't know. We have this tension, more demand and less capacity, so everybody is thinking. There are uh, projects on um, cargo metro, there are considerations on flying cars, and. Uh, I know in the past there were considerations for conveyor belt sidewalk. Okay, we say that 30 minute walking is needed to uh, keep you healthy, yes. But maybe there are some people mover solutions for city transport as well. And then what will happen to the fully automated cars? It's worthwhile thinking about them. So with this, Mr. Chair, I would like to conclude that 
please consider us as a partner. I've come here not only to tell you where we are, but also to learn from you so that we can do a better job for you. The Inland Transport Committee will meet at the end of February. The policy segment, this uh, 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 annual meeting will be Innovations for Sustainable Transport. You are most welcome. You only have to register. Um, and autonomous driving will be considered from policy point of view as well. And I think the policy considerations are more difficult than the regulatory changes. Um, you may also wish to come to New Delhi to the WP1 meeting, uh, which will deal with this and which uh, will be the first Europe-Asia Road Safety Forum. So thank you very much.